Revelation chapter 3, the last book of the Bible, the book Revelation. May the Lord help us to place new vision on old values tonight. Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, This thing saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing and knowest not. If thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint to thine eyes with eyes saith that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him. As many as I love, verse 19, I rebuke, chasten, be zealous. The word zealous transliterated from the Greek literally means boil. Jesus said, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. I am boiling hot for your house. Be zealous. You've got some problems, Laodicea. You've got to get back to the fire Amen. and start boiling with enthusiasm and power and glory. And that will correct your problems. Yes. My subject tonight is simply this. Keep the fire. Hallelujah. The theme of this conference, fresh fire. And on the last night, I'm here to tell you, keep the fire. Would I invade your, your, your privacy to ask you to say that with me? Keep the fire. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, may the will of the Lord be done here tonight. May your grace and your power and your glory be made manifest. Help us to get the fire tonight. Mm. In the name of Jesus, I take dominion over any spirit that would oppose the work of the Holy Spirit in this place. And may the, the spirit of the Lord be loosed. May the angels of the Lord encamp around about this place. And may the providence of God be here. And may we leave, be not only warmed, but set on fire by the glory of God. And everybody said amen. amen. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. If I had one bit of advice for this generation, it would just be keep the fire. Well, Brother Tenney, what about the cardinal doctrines of the scripture? I pray and trust that you will study and know the cardinal doctrines of the book. Well, what about, what about our philosophy of righteous living? I would to God that we would all live righteous and pleasing to the Lord. Laodicea was costed with many problems, but the bottom line where he drew the line and added it all up, he, he said, I'll, I'll tell you what the solution to your problems is. Be zealous. Boil. If you will keep the fire, all of these other peripheral things will come into focus. Now, there were seven churches mentioned in Asia Minor in, in the third in, in the chap these chapters of Revelation. They were seven literal churches. I personally believe they were seven prophetic churches. And I personally believe they probably indicated 
seven church ages. Well, you may say, I don't believe in that kind of dispensationalism. That is all right. It is perfectly all right to disagree with me. It's your right to be wrong. But, <laughs> but let me just say there were seven literal churches. And if a church doesn't have a reason to exist, it doesn't have a right to exist. And the first thing Jesus called the apostles to do, and the Bible said this, he called them that they might be with him. Before he ever said, go preach, go teach, go make disciples, he first called them to an intimate relationship with him. And there's a difference between being called and sent. They were called to be with him. They were sent to fulfill his mission. And there's a lot of people that try to be sent before they understand their calling. That they are called to an intimate, fiery, warm relationship with Jesus. Right. To warm by his fire and assimilate his character and nature. And be carriers of his glory. In some places, we have carriers of conflict. But not in Kentucky. So he, he blesses these churches. He tells them what's wrong with them. He <laughs> pronounces prophetic judgment on some of them. But he calls them all churches. It, it is surprising what God will put up with. I still call a church. The church is the only institution on earth designed to bring out the worst in you. Well, I don't believe that. Well, listen to me and I'll prove it to you. The church is designed to bring out the worst in you. And let me tell you why. We all want to be more like Jesus. We all want to be more like his word. So the Lord lets things happen that certain things can surface in us so that we can see it and deal with it. And that only happens in the church. You know, I didn't think church people would act like that. I didn't think people talk like that in the church. Notice how it starts. I... That's where Lucifer's problem started, with a big I. But you better thank God for that person that's number double alt sandpaper on you because they may be bringing something out in you that you were praying, Lord, I want to be more like you. Why did that person come in my life? To bring out of you something you could see that you didn't know was in you so that you could deal with it and repent over it. And they don't do that in the Rotary Club. They don't do that in Kiwanis. They don't do that in the Civitans. The only place that does that is the church of the living God. Somebody said, I want to be, I'm like Paul, I want to be crucified with Christ. Wonderful. But you can't crucify yourself. You're going to lay down on a cross. Okay, take the spike and hold it. What you going to hammer with? So you know what? The Lord sends along your best friend to do the job for you. <laughs> Oh, but I want to be okay if you want to be crucified with Christ. I'm telling you, because some of you are disagreeing with me, I'm hunting for an amen corner up here. <laughs> the church is the only institution designed to bring out the worst in you so that you can be better and then get best. The old plow horse just hit a stump, but I'll just roll over it. <laughs> Laodicea. I'm feeling so good tonight, you folks won't need your headlights when you start home in the morning. <laughs> Let me tell you, he said, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm. Well, they didn't have water heaters in those days, but they knew what he was talking about. Because from the east of the city, uh, there were aqueducts coming in from the mountains bringing cold water. The west of the city, there was aqueducts bringing hot water from hot water springs at the base of one of the mountains. Well, in certain places, these two waters merged. And when they got to the bathhouses that they were designed to go to, they were lukewarm. So the Laodiceans knew about lukewarmness. And Laodicea was known for its wealth. It was one of the wealthiest cities in Asia Minor. Not only that, they, they had a hospital that produced an eye salve 
for blindness and eye trouble, and it was the most famous hospital in Asia Minor in those days. They assisted the blind. They were the clothing center of their area. ISAF, clothing center, wealth, and then he comes along and says, you don't know that you are poor, you are blind, and you are naked. You may think you're wealthy, you're poor. You may think you can heal everybody's uh, eyes, but you're blind. You may think you have the finest clothing centers in the world, but you're naked. And I've come to correct it. They were spiritual professionals. But they had been mugged by the reality of life. They, they were called a church. I'm telling you, it's amazing what God will put up with and still call a church. But our lives begin to end the day we decide to be silent about things that matter. Now, the Holy Spirit said, now, I hear you. You need my gold tried in the fire. You need my raiment. You need my eyesight. You need to get back to the fire and start boiling because what he's saying here is the fire, the genuine fire, will settle your problems. You're having a little spiritual problem. You're lukewarm. Get back to the fire. You're having money problems. You feel like you're poor. Get back to the fire. You're having vision problems. You've lost your vision. Get back to the fire. You're having a little standard problems. Everybody's going around naked. Get back to the fire. And the fire will solve your nakedness. And the fire will solve your poverty. And the fire will solve your vision problem. You'll get your vision back. You'll be clothed in the righteousness of God. You'll see things. You Get back to the fire. I've come to tell you, keep the fire. Don't lose the fire. You can't do the work of the Holy Spirit and energy of the flesh. Now, let me tell you something. Ephesus had lost its first love, but he was in that church. Pergamos had problems with the doctrine of Balaam, but he was in that church. Thyatira had the spirit of Jezebel, but he was in that church. Sardis had a name that they lived, but they were dead, but he was in that church. The only church he was outside of and not comfortable in was the church that had no fire. He was outside knocking it. He, that wasn't so for Ephesus. Sardis, Thyatira, he put up with their false doctrines. He put up with their lack of love. But he said, there's one thing I am not comfortable in, and that's where there is no fire. Now, I'm not talking about motor emotionalism. I'm not talking about false fire. I'm talking about the real, genuine Holy Spirit with fire. Uh, oh, church is on fire against such arson. There is no law. You keep a fire in this church, and this community will come to see you burn down. Jesus doesn't knock where there's need and hunger. When he swept into the upper room with the Holy Spirit and fire, they were hungry. He didn't knock, say, can I come into the upper room? He just, shoo. but at Laodicea, we're enriched. We have need of nothing. He knocks. I don't want him to have to knock to come into my spiritual system. I want him to come not as a transient visitor, but as a perpetual guest. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Knock the doors down. Come, Holy Spirit. I'm a needy soul. I'm a hungry soul. I'm a passionate soul. After 55 years, I could bang my fire and live on the smoke. But if you're born in the fire, you're not happy in the smoke. And whatever's born in the fire won't wilt in the sun. Keep the fire. Hallelujah. Keep it. We got too many preachers that belong to the fellowship of the flashlights. They're running on man-made batteries. You can take 
a canopy and put it over a sundial and go out with a flashlight and make that sundial tell any time you want it to tell. But that's man-made. But you strip the canopy away and let the sun of righteousness shine on it and it'll tell you what time it is. Well, I want to rip the canopy. I want to throw our flashlights away and I want to know what the Spirit is saying to the church. He that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Fire. We had to see a Colossians 4.16. Colossians 4.16. Colossae, read the letter from Laodicea and let them read the letter to you. Read the letter from Laodicea. Where is the book of Laodicea? Where is the epistle to Laodicea? The Lord said there was a letter. You know where it is? careless people they were cool in their personal relationship and they got cool and careless toward the word and they lost their epistle we have no recorded letter to Laodicea but he said read the Paul said it I wrote a letter to Laodicea right. where is it when you get cool in your soul, you get careless about the word. And if there's one thing you wonderful Baptist taught me, as a young man, you taught me that this was the inerrant, infallible word of the living God. And if it was in this book, it was all authentic. Plus nothing, minus nothing. The fire stay hot. 549 times in the King James Version, the Bible speaks of fire. And most of the time it's either the fire of an awakening, a revival, or the fire of judgment or sacrifice. So we are caught between judgment and revival. You're going to get one fire or the other. Let me tell you something. You can either burn here or hereafter. You don't have any choice. You are going to get on fire somewhere. I choose to get on fire here in Berea, Kentucky, in this church. The fire of God, the passion of God, the glory of God. Fire. The fire. You know... I like zealous new Christians. But what about zealous old Christians? You, you, you ever know some other just got saved? And, oh, they're so excited about Jesus. And, 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 and not here, but in Louisiana. Somebody said, well, that's how I was when I got saved. But when I got the baptism, they'll cool down after a while. You know, they're just a little excited, you know, now. But they'll cool down. I had rather cool down a fanatic than warm up a corpse. I, I was preaching in Houston, Texas one time. This young man, in fact, he had a master's degree sitting on the front bench. And every song he was up, praise God. Oh, I was preaching. Oh, pastor, pastor told me, he said, he's brand new. I could tell he was. Because he was still excited. <laughs> Stick of dynamite wouldn't have moved some of them in that church that day. Not in Kentucky. That was in Texas. <laughs> After church, he came up to me and I was encouraging him, son, new convert. You go on with the Lord. You be loyal to this church. You be loyal. Ah, he was an Italian. He said, Prisha, I got it figured out. I said, you got it figured out? Yeah. He said, I know what to do. Man, he said, dude, I got it figured out. He, right off the streets. I said, well, good. He said, yeah, you pray, you stay. You fast, you last. You stop, you drop. I said, yeah, you got to figure it out. You pray, you stay. You fast, you last. You stop, you drop. Pretty good advice. Keep the fire. The word enthusiasm is from entheo, that's in God, 
the most exciting thing on earth ought to be Jesus. I don't ever want to lose my excitement. You find a passion. Someone said find a passion and follow it. That's all the career advice you will ever need. Because passion turns have to to want to. And a passion for Jesus devalues all other passions. If you've got a burning passion and fire and zeal for Jesus, what else, what else matters? If your relationship with him is right. Yeah, but Brother Tony, I'm going to tell you there's some fiery trials. Yeah, the Bible did mention fiery trials, didn't it? Didn't the Bible mention, fire, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials? Well, now, I want to know something. How many of you want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Amen. Well, he's not going to say medium rare, thou good and faithful servant. And the only way you can get well done is stay on the fire. <laughs> Turn up the heat. We want to be well done. <laughs> hey, hallelujah. I don't want to be medium rare, Pastor. I want to be well done. Keep the fire. Huh. It was a pillar of fire by night. It was a brazen altar of fire. How do we do it? Three quick points. First of all, you got to obtain the fire. Obtain the fire. Secondly, you got to retain the fire. And thirdly, you got to maintain the fire. Obtain the fire. No problem. The law of thermodynamics never changes. The law of ignition never changes. Now, there are two main fires in chemical analysis. I'm not a chemist and I'm not a physicist. But you can check this out. There's a fire that comes from hydrogen and oxygen and one that comes from carbon monoxide and oxygen. Now the chemical formula, or the, the formula for the hydrogen and oxygen fire is 2H2 plus O2 equals 2H2O. And for carbon monoxide and oxygen, here is the equation. It's 2CO plus O2 equals 2CO2. Now, you cannot change that formula and have the same results. Because before that formula was ever written, that's what it took. And you don't fool with the formula. If you want real fire, you got to go back and get the original formula. Now, somebody said, well, I don't want that kind of fire. I, I tell you, it's a little too hot. Let's make it 1H1 plus O1. You're not going to get an equal 2H2O. I don't care how you mix it. The only way you're going to have fire is to follow the formula. So how do we obtain the fire? Let's go back to the formula. Let's go back to the master chemist. Hallelujah. In that upper room, Day of Pentecost, I talked to you about fires in the Old Testament. Elijah said, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Whew. And he answered by fire. And he answers by fire today in the present tense. John said of Jesus, he is the one that baptizes with the Holy Ghost and fire. Ooh, you got it. Acts 1 and 8. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's a rebuke to action without accompanying power. Well, marinate your brain in a few minutes. You'll get it in the middle of the night. But somehow we got to Get the fire from the upper room to the living rooms of America today. Now, you remember second chapter of the book of Acts? Jesus had told them, go to Jerusalem and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. I could hear a mouse walking across a piece of cotton right now. Y'all are as nervous as you can be. 
But when, if I get out of the word, that's all I want you to just say, preach it. But as long as I'm in the word. Jesus said, you go to Jerusalem. There was hundreds of thousands of people lost. But he said, no, you don't go to the lost till you go to Jerusalem. Because you're going to get power from on high. But Jesus, we're your disciples. Go to Jerusalem and tear it. You, you got to obtain the fire. And what happened on the day of Pentecost? And I'm not talking about a denomination. Pentecost simply means 50. Seven weeks plus one day after the Passover came the Feast of Pentecost. It's, but it's not just a ball term of arithmetic. It means a lot more than that. What happened on that day of Pentecost? What happened on that day of Pentecost? They went to the upper room and were continually praising and blessing God. When the Bible said, suddenly, oh, I like God suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. No, it didn't come from hell like some preachers tell you. It came from heaven. There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of a fire and it sat down upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and the book said they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And people gathered. What meaneth this? Oh, these people are just drunk. That's what they said. Oh, it's just a third hour. Let me tell you something. If they thought they were drunk, how do you think they were acting? Has anybody ever accused you of being drunk on your brand of religion? You Kentuckians don't know anything about drunk people. But I'm from Louisiana. I'm from Cajun country. Unfortunately, there's some hard drinkers down there. And my dear father, rest his soul, before he got saved, he was one of them. And when you get inebriated, that's the Greek for drunk, you do some strange things. So they must have been doing some strange things. I've seen drunk people pass out. I've seen drunk people stagger. My poor daddy, when he'd get six sheets to the wind, he wanted to dance with a chair. That didn't make a bit of sense to me, but he wanted to dance with a chair. I've seen them cry. I've seen them just sit down. Oh, you know. Well, evidently they were looking at them. They said, these men are acting like drunk people the way they're staggering around. But it's just nine o'clock in the morning and nobody... Somebody might have said why, why Joe's bar is not even open. They hadn't been to Joe's bar. They've been to Joel's bar. <laughs> Joel 2.28. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith the Lord. I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Obtain it. You may as well get it the way they did. What's wrong with it? I don't believe that. Well, that's okay. Let me tell you something. All I ask you to do is tell God, Lord, I want everything you have for me. And if that's not for me, I don't want it. Just be that honest with God and see what happens. But I'm confused. Fire always confuses. When you hear fire, you don't know whether to run to it or run from it. I've heard people say, fire some buildings. But, well, I want to run to it, see it. But if you're in a mall and somebody screams fire, you're going to run from it. So fire can be confusing. I'm being transparently honest with you tonight. And these people were confused. You know, because fire does a lot of things. Fire purges. Fire cleanses. Fire destroys. Fire creates. Fire causes expansion. Fire divides. Fire fuses. Fire directs. And you'll find all of that in the Holy Ghost and fire. It can direct you. It can empower you. It can purge you. It can cleanse you. Fire. 
have what made us this. And he said, these men are not drunk as you suppose. Now, he didn't say they weren't drunk. He said they're just not drunk like you think they are. But this is that was spoken up by the prophet Joel. Now, truth never comes out of experience. Experience comes out of truth. And they were seeing an experience, but Peter said, wait a minute, this has a that in the word. And anybody that comes along with a this of an experience that doesn't have a that in the word, you better doubt this and reject that. Because ever this that's of God has a that in the word. And that's what Peter was establishing. This is that. Hallelujah. Keep the fire. I don't have time, you know. Let me tell you something. Sometimes we get into the gifts of the spirit and you got a wonderful pastor. The New Testament teaches, the epistles teach, 1 Corinthians, that there are certain men that have a right to moderate the gifts, and they are not touching God when they do. He said, for instance, let the prophets prophesy by one, and let the others, there's a group that can sit by and judge. Not judge the prophets, but their prophecy. Which might mean that they could be good people, and even valid prophets, but could get a little off. So somebody who is in charge moderates it. They don't kill the people. But they are authorized to moderate. See? And that is biblical. Oh, he touched God. He didn't know any such thing. And if they've got the right spirit and he corrected them, they'll be all right. If they get offended, they're carnal anyhow. Now, don't blame him for this. This is me. He even said, if you speak in tongues in a church, in a church service, he gave the order of how it's to be done and then shut it down. There's a devotional prayer language. But then there is a valid gift. But somebody's got to moderate whether is this somebody that's overly excited in public worship or is this a valid gift and somebody has an interpretation to this. Well, somebody's got to moderate that. So don't criticize the man of God. Now I'll tell you what, Brother Tenney, I've heard so many bad prophecies, I don't have a bit of use for them. Let me tell you something after 55 years of preaching. I've heard a lot more bad sermons than I had bad prophecies, but I'm not giving up on preaching. Woo! I'll be gone in the morning. Y'all can get back to your velvet ruts. I'll be gone. But obtain the fire in the old time way. And they said, we don't understand this. But then all of a sudden conviction fell. And they said, what must we do? And eviction causes, I mean conviction causes questions. You know, they were confused. What must we do? And the world today is still asking, what must we do? Well, they confront the fire. There may be a little confusion. They're going to end up, what if they're really convicted about what God is doing today? What must we do? And if you're not going to change the question, don't change the answer. I mean, the answer is in the second chapter of the book of Acts. What should we do? He said, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, that's just for the early church. That was just until the scriptures were canonized. Read verse 39. For the promise is unto you and your children and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And if God's still calling people today, the fire is still available. Anybody here got the old-fashioned baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire? Burn on, brother, burn on, sister. And don't mess with a formula. 
if you want the real fire, and I, I, I got to get through here, obtain the fire, retain the fire. How do you retain it? 2 Timothy 1, 6, an old apostle writes to a young preacher, stir up the gift that's in you. Yes. Timothy, oh, written to a younger generation. Let me tell this younger generation. I... I'm an old-time Pentecostal preacher. I don't have a catalytic converter on me like this squad of modern theologians do. Whatever comes out the motor's coming out the exhaust, and you're going to get it. <laughs> I'm booted, spurred, ready to ride. Got my rifle cocked and a pistol in my sock. I want you to obtain it, and I want you to retain it. And an older generation wrote to a younger generation and said, stir up the gift, and the Greek word for stir is anzapurio. And it literally means give it a poke. And young Timothy knew what it meant because they'd get up in the morning, and his mother would say, Timothy, anzapurio. That meant go to the fireplace and poke around and see if there's any live coals left and fan them and blow them until you get fire again. And he said, Timothy, you've gotten a little cool, son. Anzapurio, I've come to tell you to give your experience a good poke, and that's what I'm doing tonight. I'm stirring you up. I'm making you think. Hallelujah. <laughs> Is there any fire? Is there any fire? You, you got to retain it. Mm. Look for some live coals instead of dead ashes. How do we retain it? The answer to lukewarmness is to boil. Stay close to the fire. Stay close to the fire. Don't ever trade relational power for positional power. I'm a religious bureaucrat. I've been what they call in my flow a bishop for many, many years. What's a bishop? Well, the oldest place in the profane Greek, and you have to go to the profane Greek to find out what those words meant. Because the New Testament was not written in a highfalutin theological. It was street Greek. And the first they found in an ancient document. The first usage of a bishop was he was the straw boss on a road gang. Let me tell you what the straw boss was. That was the man when the foreman of that little group working on the road had to go report to his bosses. He turned and say, Joseph... You take over while I'm gone. It was the lowest job, the job of most servitude. So any of these fellows that think bishop is a big title, they are the lowest office on the totem pole, and they're nothing but servants. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful Catholic people, and they have bishops. And, I, and the bishops, and where I come from, the Catholics, they tell the churches what to do and they tell the priest where to go well in my flow the preachers tell the bishop what to do and sometimes the churches tell him where to go <laughs> Baptists aren't like that but anyhow Paul said the love of Christ constraineth me the NIV said it compels me Another translation said the love of Christ controls me. The same word in the gospel describes those controlled by a disease. In, in 1 and 30 of Mark, Peter's mother-in-law was controlled by a fever. The word is pereso. It means to be on fire. And what Paul is saying is that the love of Christ takes control of my life the same way a disease fever takes control of the body. And you burn all over. And instead of aching all over, you love all over. Yes. When that fever contagion, the fire of the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you. Fire. Obtain it. Retain it. By every now and then you just got to give it a good poke. And stir it up and let the preacher stir you up. And, and I, I was at a place several months back and I heard a preacher had been pastor in the same church 30 years. He said, I do not offend people when I preach. Pastor in that church, 30, I, I poked the fellow next to me. I said, you know what he just said? Yeah. 
So what do you mean? I said, he just told us that he never preached a cotton picking thing. <laughs> Any man ever pastored church 30 years never offended anybody? He ain't, he ain't done nothing. I mean, he hasn't got enough power. And I won't go there, but... I mean, you get close up here, you either going to get powder burned or the drippings off the altar. It depends on how you live. But burn with it. Burn with it. Fire confined produces power. You, you, you can let off some steam and, and turn it into power. Well, I don't know. I'm just so disgusted with my church. I heard about a man the other day that ran out of sick days and he called in dead. <laughs> We're all different. You may as well be yourself. Everybody else is taken. And I'm going to be myself. You know what I, you knew what it was for you sent for me. I just come to tell you, keep the fire. There shouldn't be a religious refrigerator where you keep perishable parties, but it's a horse, a fireplace. Brother Tenney, there's other groups, and God bless them, but they've got such beautiful cathedrals. That's right. They may have the fireplace, but we got the fire. No, I'm not being critical. Please don't, don't read. Uh, I hope you build a cathedral here someday. But keep the fire. Last but not least, maintain it. And to maintain the fire, you got to obtain it and, and, and retain it. And you know what was wrong in Laodicea? You know why they couldn't maintain it? They were lukewarm. They were saying, Jesus, we still believe in you but we're just not excited anymore. Is there anybody here still excited about Jesus? Don't ever lose it. You're lukewarm if you do. Don't ever lose the sharp edge of the spiritual excitement of being born again of the water and the spirit and knowing that you've met Jesus and he's baptized you with the Holy Ghost. Woo! Blessed Jesus. What fuels the fire? Prayer brings him and prayer keeps him. It was fire that Abraham took to Mount Moriah to complete his commission. He took a fire pan with him. He didn't have matches. That's why Isaac said, Father, here's the wood and there's the fire. And there's the knife. Where's sacrifice? What do you mean there's the fire? When he left home, he took a pan and put live coals in it because they didn't have matches. It could take a half a day and if the wood was wet up there, he could never... So he brought fire from home. You know what you need to do? In those days, the only way they could build a fire was rub dry sticks together or hit flinty rocks. And if it was wet on the mountain, he could have delayed it for a week and said, I'm sorry, God, I can't get a fire started up here. So he just took his fire with him. Before you come here, bring you some fire from home. Have you an altar at home where you fire up? Don't wait till you get here and this man of God and this worship leader has got to flinch you together to try to get a spark. If you bring your fire and I bring my fire, we're going to have a bonfire. Keep the fire. The prayer room is your boiler room. Oh. Deuteronomy 4.33 said, We hear his voice out of the midst of fire. You keep a fire and you'll hear the voice of God. And people will leave a cathedral and go to a cave if there's fire there. When Moses finished the tabernacle, the fire and the glory fell. When Solomon finished the temple, the fire and the glory fell. Keep the fire. Keep the fire. Keep the fire. Please keep the fire. Be hungry for it. Don't lose your appetite. Oftentimes appetite makes the difference. Jacob was potentially a prince or a rascal. Both potentials were in him. He was, but he was reaching for Esau's heel when he was born. 
And God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Why? Jacob had a hunger for the spiritual things and Esau for the natural and appetite made the difference. The only thing that kept God from being known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau was one bowl of soup. You understand that? Appetite. What are you hungry for? Well, just kind of the status quo. In fact, Brother Tenney, I'll be glad when this is over with and we can get back to business as usual. Well, I don't understand. Oh, y'all still love me? Why is it that only in religion do people want to say, if I don't understand it, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. When in the world, you embrace many things that you don't understand and never question. I was raised on a dairy farm. But I don't know how a black cow eats green grass and gives white milk and you get yellow butter and orange cheese. And so since I don't understand that, I'm not drinking milk anymore. Don't bring me any more butter. Don't bring me in. No, honey, bring it on. Whether I understand it or not, I see the evidence. It's real. A lot of things. They say nothing sticks to Teflon. Well, how does Teflon stick to the pan? Quit cooking with Teflon till you can figure that one out. I don't understand it. If I owned an automobile, if I owned an automobile that could travel at the speed of light, what would happen if I turned on my headlights? Why do kamikaze pilots wear helmets? A lot of things we don't understand. I ride airplanes all the time and they tell us if the thing ever crashes, there's an indestructible black box. You don't worry, it's indestructible and they'll find out why it crashed. Well, if that black box is indestructible, why don't they make the whole plane out of that stuff? A lot of things we don't understand. If you can explain everything that's happening in this church, God isn't here. Did you hear me? Let me say it again. If you can explain everything that's happening here, God isn't here. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm through. Get excited over little things. A smoking flax I won't quench. If you can just get a little smoke. I wish I could just see one little bit of smoke from some of you folks in the cheap seats back there. If I could just get one little bit of smoke, I'd preach till midnight. Whew. Oh, God. Don't worry, I'm not coming back. Pastor's already made up his mind. But I'm just coming to tell you, keep the fire. Keep it. Don't lose it. It's what the old time fire. If you brought sickness, don't you believe he can bring healing? And there's healing in this fire. Fire removes fear. Fire makes you do things you'd never think of doing. People have jumped out of hotel windows into what looks like trampolines from several stories up because of fire. Others have been rescued from the top of the building on a rope by a helicopter that wouldn't have dared climb that rope. But fire makes you do things. It puts you in another realm. That's why I'm calling for you to keep the fire. Keep the fire. Keep the fire. I close with this. You'd have to be west of 50 to even remember this, but some of us can remember when they, the TVA came into Tennessee, the Tennessee Valley Authority, with the great system of dams and built that tremendous hydroelectric system. But let me, let me tell you some stories from 50 plus years ago that you might not know. A lot of people lost their homes 
the government went into those mountain areas where, as Becky said, where the hillbillies were. And they had to buy them out. Well, some of them had been there for generations. It wasn't easy. But they knew that the dams were going to back the rivers up and up the mountains. And they, they compensated them. There was one old man was past 80 years old that lived in a cabin up on the side of the mountain that wouldn't sell out. They sent the estimators. They sent the supervisors. And every time they'd come up to his cabin, he'd step out on the front porch with a double barrel shotgun and say, don't come any further. I ain't moving. Yeah. They reasoned with him. They pled with him. They raised the ante. I ain't moving. Finally, the main superintendent of the entire TVA construction came and went up and he told him, he said, Sir, we're about to close the locks. You cannot stay here. Please, we will build you a new cabin further up on this same mountain. We'll build it. I know this has been home and you don't want to leave this home. He said, it ain't the cabin. He said, well, what is it? It was in July. He kicked the door open and in the hearth, there was a blazing fire in July. He said, it's the fire. And the superintendent said, what do you mean? He said, well, my mammy and papa were married a long time. They didn't have no young'uns and said, my pappy told God if he'd give him a boy the day that boy was born, he'd start a fire in that hearth and as long as he lived, it'd never go out as a memorial to answer prayer. And he said, I was born and Papa built the fire and before he died, he told me to never let it go out. And said, it ain't gone out. And said, so I ain't leaving this fire. So the superintendent thought, he said, let me ask you a question. Suppose we can devise a way to move this fire without it ever going out to a new cabin. Thought a minute, he said, if you move the fire without it going out, okay. Yeah. He said, all right, just give us time. So they immediately went up, and in a few weeks they had him a lovely place cleared further up the mountain and had him a nice cabin built, and the day came for him to move, and they went and they brought three men with wheelbarrows and several others. And they put on a plank and rolled him up into his cabin. And he was standing there with a shotgun watching that fire and watching those men. And they took shovels and they had fuel. And they put it in those three wheelbarrows and they kept feeding the same fire. And they went down and they started up the side of the mountain with that old man right behind them. Seeing that the old fire didn't go out. You can move to a new facility, Pastor, but don't ever lose that fire. Wherever you go, you keep the fire. You keep the fire. Will you stand with me? Anybody here hungry for the fire? Oh, anybody here hungry to obtain the fire? Retain the fire? You got to keep fueling it. You got to keep feeding it with worship and with prayer and with hunger. And you know what this old preacher's doing here? I'm riding shotgun on the fire. If I ever come back, I'm going to want to know, did the fire go out? Have you still got the fire? He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Oh, hallelujah. Clap your hands to the Lord. Applaud the Lord.